Hey, what's up guys? So I was lucky enough to interview the CEO of Deep Green and ask him all the questions that I wanted to. Before we get into that, I'm just going to play the videos that I made about them and then we can get into the interview. So let's get into it. So this is a deep sea polymetallic nodule and it's found at the bottom of the ocean floor, just like this. And what's unique about this is it's made up of nearly 100% usable minerals. And this is around 30% of the minerals in the nodules. And you'll notice that they're basically what's used in the battery of an electric vehicle. And there's not just a few of these nodules either. In the Clarion Clipperton zone right off of North America, there's enough of these nodules to electrify over a billion cars. Now look, there's a ton of these minerals on land too, so why is this better? One way they're better is that these batteries have cobalt, which is used in batteries to extend their lifespan, but it's currently mined in the Congo. But that's just for one of these minerals. So when it comes to mining things like nickel, manganese, and copper, one of the bigger benefits is that the carbon emissions are a lot lower in gigatons. On land, it costs 1.45 gigatons, and the nodules are only 0.43. There are a ton of amazing stats for the nodules like this. And we're finally starting to mine these nodules. One of my favorites is this really cool startup named Deep Green. They just purchased this former deep water drilling vessel and they're conducting ocean research before mining here. They'll drop in this mining vessel, scoop up the nodules and start making cleaner batteries. So this is a deep sea polymetallic nodule and it's found at the bottom of the ocean floor just like this. Now you may remember that I made a video about this a few weeks ago because the materials in the nodule are the same as that in an electric vehicle battery. Anyways, it turns out that the company collecting these saw my video, so they sent me one. Let's check it out. Okay, so here's the package, and it's bigger than I was expecting. It's like the size of my hand. And this is cool. It has the longitude and the latitude of where it was collected. This is from just off the coast of Mexico. Okay, let's check this out. And whoa, okay. Look at all the different colors in there. Check that out. That's sick. Okay, so here's the top, and here's the bottom. From this to this. So right now I'm holding a lot of materials, but mostly nickel, copper, manganese, and cobalt. So it's essentially an electric vehicle battery in a rock. So since this comes from the ocean and it's used to make batteries, I'm sure you guys have a ton of questions about this. So I'm partnering with Deep Green to make video responses to your questions in the comments below. So go ask some questions. Okay, so how is this deep sea polymetallic nodule formed in the ocean? So first off, there are three different types of deep sea resources. The first are polymetallic sulfides formed on massive hydrothermal vents. But as you can see, there's a ton of life on here and it requires digging and drilling into the crust to get the metals, which we're trying to avoid. Then there's resources that form in cobalt-rich crust, which you also have to drill into the middle of the seabed to get at. Both of these require similar methods to land mining, which like I said, we're trying to avoid. But then there's this third one, these polymetallic nodules, which look like this. These were mainly formed from nickel and copper deposits in the Andes and the Rockies, slowly drifting into the ocean over time. These metallic compounds collected together over millions of years and form these nodules, which sit on the ocean floor just like this. And while there is life here in the deep ocean, it's only 0.1% of the biomass typically found on land. And since they're just sitting on the ocean floor, they can be scooped up like this instead of drilling into the seabed or creating massive landmines. The area where this one came from is called the Clarion Clipperton Zone, which I'll talk more about in the next video. Okay, so since these are collected on the bottom of the ocean floor, what will be the impact of collecting these for batteries? Well, that's why the International Seabed Authority was created. They basically regulate all mineral resource activities in international waters. But in 2011, they granted deep green exploration contracts in the Clarion Clipperton zone. And this is also where my nodule came from. As part of this contract, they're conducting one of the world's largest ocean research initiatives, which studies the ocean from the surface all the way down to the seabed. And so they're investing over 65 million into hundreds of independent researchers to produce over 100 original studies analyzing all aspects of the water column. This includes everything from measuring the potential sea plumes and categorizing the biodiversity. This is way more comprehensive than land mining research, which typically only categorizes visible organisms and skips over microorganisms. And it's only if the International Seabed Authority agrees that the 100 independent research studies show that this method is low impact to the ecosystem, then they will begin to collect and process the nodules. This research is currently underway and it's already looking promising. Okay, so how many of these nodules are required to make a Tesla battery cell? Well, if you crush up the nodule and then flow the materials through a crucible, after about 20 nodules, you end up with the right amount of metals to create a Tesla cell. And some of these materials are also used to make the copper wiring in the car. So since a standard Tesla Model 3 battery pack contains around 4,400 of these cells, you would need around 88,000 of these nodules to produce one Model 3. And that sounds like a lot until you realize that there are trillions of these on the ocean floor. But don't worry, we don't need all of them. For example, some of these nodules are found in the Clarion Clipperton zone. And within this zone, the International Seabed Authority has already marked 30% for conservation. And then within this zone, Deep Green will only mine in these three areas. They will also set aside up to 30% of their areas, but even still, there's enough nodules to produce over 255 million electric vehicles. And currently, there are only 4.8 million electric vehicles. And since it looks like harvesting the nodules is more sustainable than land mining, this is a potential solution for Tesla's battery material needs.
So, hey, Jared, thank you for uh, the time today. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, I just wanted to start off and ask you, like, you seem like such a prolific entrepreneur. How many startups have you started and uh, when did you get into this? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, this is my, I guess, fifth company. And I started my my first startup was back at university days. And, um, you know, I, I year one of university, I, I had like four jobs working and I figured there was no capacity for job number five. So I had to rethink this money making caper. And so I was, uh, I started my first company in, in my second year at uni. And mm. so, um, yeah, I, I, and I, what, what was that company? Well, you know, it was back in the time when interest rates were really high in Australia, and I was studying economics and marketing. And um, but interest rates were starting to to fall. Like a mortgage was twenty percent interest rate, right? And so the the Reserve Bank was starting to drop interest rates every month. And so I realized there was an arbitrage between the rates that people had bought assets for at a high interest rate and the opportunity to refinance them at a much lower interest rate. And so I was able, I bought myself a suit and a tie (laughs) and I arranged a uh, a finance introductory agreement. And I used to go to mainly primary producers or trucking companies and help them refinance an asset that they'd acquired at 20% interest. And I could help them rebuy it at 12% interest and I'd make a margin in the middle. Yeah. And so that was, um, Yeah, I got to the end of. And then you were kind of hooked. Yeah, that's. I, I got to the end. <laughs> my mates were applying to these great jobs and getting them, and I thought, "Wow, what am I going to do?" And, I, and then I realized, "Hey, I've got a job," and uh, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I've never, I've never spent a day working for anyone else. So. Mm-hmm. so after you started that company, then did you sell that, and what did you move on to next? Well, actually, what I did was I was um, I started to. I grew that business, but I always liked investing in other ideas. And so I invested mm. in a company which in the end uh, needed me to get very hands-on. And so I, um, yeah, I, I had to get roll the sleeves up and uh, it was a publishing company of all things. And, um, and I ended up selling that out to, to my partners. We, we became a very successful publisher and uh, but the industries I've been involved in are, are automotive battery manufacturing, which was kind of ironic mm. because we were making <laughs> reactive batteries. But I, I had uh, factories in China in the early '90s and built distribution in Europe and in Australia. And then uh, I sold that back to the Chinese. And then I was involved in the telco industry. And most recently, I started a company. Well, recently, 2001 which I grew to 30 countries around the world. And, uh, and here I am today. <laughs> what was the country, uh, company that you grew to uh, all those countries? Uh, it was a company, a SaaS company called AdStream. And so it was, um, we, we were building a, a digital superhighway that allowed the uh, digital transportation of content, mainly advertising content. And mm. once again, it was built with an environmental focus in mind. So instead of you know making content and putting it on on tapes, which went on bikes or on airplanes and flown around the world, you know, we mm. turned it into big digital files. And uh, and this was before the internet was as you know as common as it is today. But sending mm. a, a, a thousand megabyte file wasn't uh, a, wasn't a, a trivial matter. And so uh, yeah. So it seems like you've jumped across a lot of industries. How do you like find the next opportunity? Well, you know, I guess as I uh, as I matured, <laughs> I was lucky enough to have some more success under my belt. And so, you know, when I I when we started Deep Green, I never envisaged that I would run it per se. I, I was the investor, and but then I. You know, the data kind of set me free because it, it came, you know, at a time in my life where I'd, I'd grown the other business and, you know, I just realized that actually climate change is an existential crisis, you know, and, and as I got more into the data behind the mining industry and the need to move away from fossil fuels, I realized that this could be a really important initiative that, that needed 
some tenacity and some drive to make it happen. And, you know, I'm particularly attracted to really challenging tasks. And Mm -hmm. I can assure you this is a challenging task. We have a deep green. And so, yeah, I was I was attracted to all of those elements, and and I actually realized that even though I hadn't been a mining executive or building, you know, major mines around the world, um, that I didn't need to be, and I didn't need to have a mining person or a, or a resources person run this project because actually, you know, what I realized is that we need to earn the social license to do this. We need to build this on an environmental platform because this is about what is going to be the best thing for the planet you know and I, I obviously it now occupies you know 164 hours of my my week and mm-hmm. helping gather the science and the information so we can make more informed decisions is and then how we communicate that information is crucial to the establishment of this industry so absolutely so how did you first come across nodules. I've heard that you were investing in another company and then you, there were multiple types of nodules and then you found this one. So maybe if you could just speak to that. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so once again, in 2001, I, I, uh, a friend of mine had started this company and it was also about the ocean and getting metals out of the ocean. And I knew nothing about mining and I knew mm-hmm. nothing about the oceans really other than surfing. And so <laughs> I realized that actually that I was intrigued by it. I, I was intrigued to learn that the oceans were filled with metals. And, and so, but they were focused on something very different. They were focused on sulfides, which are like these chimneys that form where the tectonic plates meet. And, um, and so they were focused on identifying and getting the metals out of those, which in the end, the oceans are filled with several types of metals, right? There are these, which we're 100% mm-hmm. focused on. And, and these literally sit on the ocean floor just like golf balls on a driving range. Whereas the other ocean metals, you've got to go down and mine them. You know, you've got to turn big rocks into little rocks and then move them to the surface. It's and so- more similar to land mining, and there's a lot more biological like diversity at those locations. There is, that's right. I mean, um, you know, we're talking um, 4,000 meters below sea level, which is where our nodules are. So it's an entirely different resource, uh, and we don't have to dig or drill or, or blast to get them. We just have to collect them, and and that doesn't mean it's not an important environment. It is an important environment, but of course, mm-hmm. one of the arguments that that we make, and I'm always, you know, find myself in discussions with ocean scientists, right? And we have a lot of ocean scientists, some of the best in the world, on our team, and and they obviously you know, are very intent on making sure we do the right thing as, as we are across the entire organization. But when I think about the oceans or, or the rainforests, you know, I think we need to think from a planetary perspective. We can't be just trying to protect, you know, one single part of our rainforests or one single part of our ocean. We have to be making decisions that are, are planet-based. What's going to have the lowest impact? And that's why... As an organization, you know, we've just completed this big uh, white paper, which did a a complete life cycle analysis of what will be the impacts if we Mm -hmm. continue to build those batteries that you talk about on your show, Jack, you know, if we build them from terrestrial known sources, or is there a better place to get those metals? And from our perspective, at this moment, we think there's only one place to get them. And, uh, and that's from these, from the bottom of the ocean. Because, you know, I guess what we're debating with, um, with our ocean science research program, which, by the way, is the, the biggest ever seafloor to ocean top ocean research program, okay? Mm-hmm. Biggest ever. We'll spend $65 million. We're in the middle of spending it right now to get answers to those questions. But, you know, what we're trying to do is anticipate what those impacts will be. But the thing is, we know the impacts of getting these metals from land, right? Mm-hmm. It's like we know the impacts of burning fossil fuels. They're horrible, right? They contribute to global warming. They contribute to rising sea levels. And mm-hmm. that's why the world is focused on moving away from them. Now, of course, to build batteries, you need a lot of metals. You need the nickel and the copper and cobalt and manganese. Now, traditionally, you get that from land-based sources. And... Mm-hmm the impacts of doing that are also there for us to see. And, and so these nodules 
these nodules were formed from uh, the Andes mountain, is that correct? And then they're mostly purely nickel uh, or uh, like a large percentage of them is nickel. So then compared to land mining where you're maybe getting percentages of the tonnage that you're collecting, uh, mm -hmm. you're getting a much higher yield from what you're doing uh, yeah. with these nodules. Well, let me maybe just make one or two slight changes, but but they these mm -hmm. grow, right? they precipitate the metals that are either in the ocean water or that mm -hmm. are in the sediment. And so you're right to say that uh, we're in the Pacific Ocean, but we benefit from the fact that once upon a time, the Andes and the Rockies were covered in nickel and copper. And as all of those ice caps melted and the, 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 the copper tops and the nickel tops eroded into the rivers and then into the Pacific Ocean, those metals or minerals settled in the sediment and then these started to grow. Now, they, these modules are found in some other locations around the world as well, but they don't have the nickel and don't have the copper, and so they're not even economic to recover. So this is the area of most interest. And by revenue, about half of it is nickel, okay? And so mm. you think of it as a nickel project. And, I mean, how appropriate, right? Because, as you know, the car industry is settled on, on an NMC, nickel manganese cobalt, battery chemistry. Yeah, I mean, Elon was just uh, begging for more nickel, <laughs> uh, yeah. calling for more nickel for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think his words were similar to, like, we need the lowest impact, you know, sort of these metals. But when you know where these metals are coming from on land, that's a tall order because to get to these, uh, the main ongoing source of nickel on land is from nickel laterites. And, and they form through uh, wet leaching over millions of years. And wet means rain, trees, biodiverse habitats. So you've got to destroy our carbon sinks. You've got to destroy the, some of the most biodiverse areas on the planet to get to it. And then the process of taking the nickel out of it, because, you know, the other thing about land-based ores is they tend to have lots of deleterious elements like arsenic and mercury and so on. And, and whereas we have none of that, you know, we, we have, so we don't generate any of those nasty tailings that mm -hmm. we see on land-based uh, operations. And, and even when those tailings dams are operated by some of the most credible companies in the mining space, they have a habit of failing, you know, as we mm. saw in Brazil in recent years. And now you're finding major investor groups um, say, hey, we we want to divest from oil and gas, but mm. we also maybe want to divest from operations that generate these tailings because they have consequences now and in the future. So you're going to mine these and then set up like a metal processing on land, which is going to be a lot lower impact than any land-based mining could have yeah it, it's really hard to get away from the language but we're going to collect them because we don't have to mine them mm. Per se. Mm. That's, like, yeah that's a good point yeah but don't worry i find myself i've uh, been drawn into saying those words at times and so yeah so what we do is we collect them we take them to our land-based processing uh facilities and, and you know that's the beauty that we are not being hemmed in by infrastructure because if you think about terrestrial projects they tend to be, firstly, getting anything permanent in the world is really challenging, even in the even in developing world. And the thing about uh, those resources that have not been developed is they tend to be in really remote places, places with no roads, no rail, no power, no deep water ports, no workforce. And so the infrastructure hurdles are enormous because mm -hmm. you've got to spend tens of billions of dollars in some cases just to get access to them. Uh, whereas from our perspective, you know, we will build our, our collector systems wherever it makes most sense and we'll bring them up to our production vessel and then we can ship them north or south or east or west. And, and the beauty is we'll locate our refining centers near renewable power sources, near deep mm. water ports. So we'll... Where are you? Do you have a specific location in mind so far? Well, yeah, we, we've identified 10 spots and we're currently negotiating with governments for okay. to get them permitted and um but if you can think of areas with deep water ports and lots of renewable power so for example norway classic you know norway has an abundance of renewable mm -hmm. power available to it um parts of asia have lots of renewable power we're negotiating with a site in australia 
we're negotiating with parts uh, sites in Canada and also in, in the US of A. So, yeah, so, so but it, it allows us to set a really high um, hurdle for what needs to be in place before we would agree to build a processing plant. So, uh, what, what do you mean by a high hurdle? Or you're saying that there's a lot of options? Yeah, must have renewable power, you know, mm -hmm. must have a deep water port because, you know, to build a deep water port costs billions of dollars, right? And so that would be a, a hurdle that we, you know, we don't want to have to build that. We want to take advantage of existing infrastructure. Uh, but the most important one is renewable power. Mm -hmm. And so when you process the metals, it will all be done by renewable energy. Largely, well. largely. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and because you have two options when you turn these into battery materials, right? You can either melt them or mm -hmm. you dissolve them in an acid solution. And so we've done a lot of work on both. Um, our first operation will be based around melting them. But over time, okay. we'll, we'll have a combination of both. So. Oh, real, that's really awesome. So can you speak to how the ISA is now like allowing this and the research programs that you're doing? Uh, sure for the mining or for collecting the modules? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so another really cool part about our project is that we're in the high seas, right? Because mm -hmm. people often say, this is so obvious, Jared. Why hasn't it happened before? Well, the fact is it almost did happen before. Back in the 1970s, there were several consortia who built the harvesters, who went 4,000 meters below water, who mm -hmm. built the processing facilities to turn these into... They, were make, they weren't focused on battery materials, but they were looking for the nickel and the copper, and they were very successful. But no one had worked out who owned the oceans, and they all operated on the assumption that they would be able to lay claim to mm. the part of the ocean. But and it was, In fact, it was Henry Kissinger at the time who wrote to the ambassadors of the United Nations and said, hey, we, we want to claim this part of the Pacific Ocean, and all the ambassadors got together and went, hmm. That doesn't sound too equitable. Uh, so they had to stop. And fast forward to 1982 when the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea was agreed and signed. Mm. And that basically says as a sovereign, you own everything within 12 miles from your coastline and you have an economic right to everything within 200 miles. But beyond that, it's not yours. It's known as the mm. common heritage of mankind. And so that's where we are. We're like more than a thousand miles off the coast of Mexico. There's no land anywhere near us. And so the United Nations agreed to set up the International Seabed Authority to govern the high seas. And so they were, were put into place in 1994. And their principal objective was to put in place a regulatory environment that allowed the development of this resource. And here we are in 2020, and so we're on the doorstep of it. And, you know, it's been very slow, but it's also been very thoughtful. And, and the reason why it's slow is because the members of the International Seabed Authority are 168 countries around the world. Mm. In fact, a high bureaucracy. High bureaucracy. So slow, but, but kind of safe as well, because mm. one of the challenges in the developing world is that things change. You know, sometimes governments can prove to be corrupt or governments make a decision but it gets overturned on one for one reason or another and so we think the international seabed authority represents low sovereign risk firstly and it's also really good to have one central regulator who's going to help make sure that a very high standard is enforced because you know there should be no corners cut so you've got to balance that with the fact that you know you have this insatiable demand coming from the marketplace now for battery materials mm -hmm. and um yeah so we so we think the international seabed authority is a is a great regulator to have um mm -hmm. and one of the ways that you're working with the isa is by performing this large research um yeah. like independent research to verify that this will be definitely better than the land mining yeah, so we currently have exploration licenses, and mm -hmm. that gives us a, an exclusive right for 15 years to do the work that's necessary to apply to be able to extract the metals. And mm -hmm. so as part of that, we have to complete an environmental impact assessment, which means that 
that $65 million I was talking about means we're, we'll be spending that money to get answers to the questions about what are the impacts, if any, what are the impacts mm -hmm. of taking away these nodules, of, of putting these collectors on the ocean floor, of, of moving across the floor and collecting these. It'll create some dust, of course. But, you know, giving specific answers to questions that otherwise people make up the answers. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. people say, oh, the, this, these dust plumes will travel for, you know, tens and dozens and dozens of miles wrong. You know, and that's, that's <laughs> of doing these environmental impact assessments so we can provide accurate answers. And, and then it's only at the end of us completing that work that we'll be able to put our application forward to the regulator to say, okay, hmm. the, the, these are our studies. Um, we have we've done a lot more studies than we were required to do because as an organization, we really wanted to set a really, once again, a high hurdle. We wanted to do more hmm. than you know, would be reasonably required because from our perspective, you know, we want society to look back and say this was a really great thing. Deep Green was a really cautious operator and we went, mm -hmm. you know, beyond what's even reasonable. To, to see and so you're seeing early results that uh, the dust doesn't last in the ocean as long as uh, previously yeah. expected? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Mm, that's awesome. That's really yeah. good to hear. Well, you know, one of the ways you can tell is – you know, we have collected hundreds and hundreds of box scores. You, you can see them on our, our website. We, we drop this uh, box score. It hits the bottom of the ocean. It creates a massive mm -hmm. uh, dis disturbance. But, you know, you get full visibility back in like 30 seconds. Everything kind of resettled. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, we deployed uh, these, these um, beacons, if you like, that we've positioned on the bottom of the ocean you know, midway up the water column where it's collecting all of this sort of data. Uh, and, you know, at, at the end of next year, we'll be ready to go out on the water to put into place our trial collector system. And that's going to allow us to, to you know, monitor the impacts once again uh, and to mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, we're fully assessing, you know, what, mm -hmm. what are the, the consequences. So how has the uh, technology progressed from like the 70s to now where you're collecting them on the bottom of the floor? Like, is there any cool technology that you're using or uh, is it mostly the same or how has that changed? Well, let's just imagine. So 50 years ago, um, this was a pretty groundbreaking project, right? And so what's happened since then is the offshore oil and gas industry has expanded uh, cable lane, you know, so that there are now cables, mm -hmm. telecommunications cables, or fiber optic through, cables, fiber mm -hmm. optics. There are there are gas pipelines everywhere. So the expertise that's been developed over the last fifty years is enormous. And so it's um, you know when we've engaged with quite a few partners in the offshore space, and they're like, ah, we got this. You know, this is our everyday bread and butter. Um, and so is that all seas? All Seas is one of them. I mean, All Seas mm -hmm. are one of the, the world's most respected and largest layers of pipe for the oil and gas industry. You know, they do it 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Um, and so we're very lucky to have them as one of our partners because they understand this environment. You know, they're an engineering-led company. They Their most recent uh, engineering feat was to build a, a ship that – allows you to take down these big oil production platforms when they're finished with in a single mm -hmm. lift. Normally it can take you like five months to decommission them, whereas Allsea's built this enormous ship that just goes out, envelopes it, jacks it up and takes it back, and then they do wow. the <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's an amazing. So it's fully extended. It's the world's largest ship. It's like 470-plus metres long. And okay. so... So they are engineering proud. You know, they, they have, you know, an amazing team working on our project. And so they have wonderful research and development facilities. And so for them, they're in an industry that they know in, in years to come will not be keeping their fleet of ships busy. So they need to find something new to do, right? As does everyone in the offshore industry from the offshore if you're servicing oil and yeah, gas. Yeah, I was going to say it's really awesome to see all these, you know, oil and gas services transferring into uh, renewable energy and taking like their expertise and their uh, pockets, their money. 
Exactly. That's right. Because, um, you know, they, they've built up enormous expertise and the assets they, that they have, you know, are either going to look like floating pieces of steel or mm-hmm. really important production assets for people like us. And so that's where we're embracing that industry. And thankfully, they seem to be very excited about our industry about putting that expertise and those uh, those assets to work. But you know what, Jack, we, we don't know 100% what the best way of collecting the nodules will be. And so we, we've had a steady stream of companies come to us to say, hey, I want to explore. Oh, sorry, it froze just a little bit. The opportunities are endless. And I think from our perspective, what we know is that We've got a lot of nodules, right? We've already defined like 1.6 billion tons of these. Mm. So that's a lot. That's enough to build more than 255 million 75 kilowatt batteries. So that's a lot. Mm. So what we're saying to industry is, listen, you know, work with us. You know, let's identify what the lowest impact is. We think it's a tracked vehicle, and that's certainly what all C's believe. But but there are some people who who are experimenting with other ideas, and we say. Come on in. You know, let's let's uh, find. Them. What did those other ideas look like? If you can speak about those. Well, they they look like uh, drones. You know that mm. that actually, you know, operate to collect nodules at a at a ferocious pace. Um, mm. They look like uh, not tracked vehicles, but other sorts of collectors that that are able to. Um, you know, not crawl on like caterpillar tracks, but actually get mm. dragged along. And okay. so, and there are some other ideas that are that are even, you know, crazier than that that I'm mm-hmm. I'm not ready to talk about. But from but this will be an exciting part, right? Because mm-hmm. from an engineering perspective, it's like, hey, let's let's figure it out. You know, I, the, the, definitely. The, let's let's get our best minds because the one thing that engineers love is a problem to solve. And uh, yeah, you know, this one seems like a pretty simple one, and and in comparison to some of the issues that engineers have sold in, in our lifetime. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So you mentioned uh, 275 million electric vehicles, and that's from this small area in the Clarion Clipperton zone. Um, that's, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 255 million. That's just on our two of our blocks. So we have three blocks in the area, and mm-hmm. on two of them, we have enough nickel and enough cobalt and enough copper and a lot of manganese to build 255 million EV batteries. So yeah. that's pretty good. And, and, and that's on less than a like half a percent of the total ocean uh, area. Yeah, even less than that, actually. You know, a lot of people wonder, hey, are we, and if you, if you listen to, you know, people that go, oh, this is going to be, going to plunder the oceans it's like come on the oceans are 361 million square kilometers Mm -hmm. currently if you wanted to build a billion ev batteries so one billion you'd need to put aside 500,000 508,000 square kilometers of the ccz so okay 108 of 361 million so it's a really tiny (laughs) area so Mm -hmm. thank heavens that Mother Nature put all of these nodules in one little area that contain all the metals we need. You know, so it's mm-hmm. not over, you know, it's not covering large swathes in relative yeah. time. And, and they're just on the surface of the and, floor and instead of having to mine. Yeah, exactly. Instead of like other vents. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. No, so it's got a lot of as a resource, it's got a lot of things going for it. And it's it's 2D, right? Whereas most resources on land are 3D. You can you might be able to, you know, see parts of it, but you've got to drill lots of holes because you've got to go deep to find it. Whereas ours, it's it's all very visible. So mm-hmm. it means estimating it and understanding it is is really important. And and we also use something um, because of that. It's it we use adaptive management to manage the environmental impacts as well. You know, so we'll have what's known as a digital twin that will be basically uh, emulating ex- everything that's going on in the on the ocean floor, you know, the regulator will be able to see what's happening in, in real time. Mm. And if we came across an area that, you know, for some reason 
had more biodiversity or, or and keep in mind we're talking 4000 meters it's it's not as though you find plants you don't find you know an abundance of fish moving about there are organisms there don't get me wrong but they mainly mm -hmm. are m microbial they kind of live in the sediment you also find every now and then something uh, living on a nodule but it's it's a low energy area okay there's mm -hmm. not a lot of food in there at 4,000 meters. Most of the ocean life is in the top 200 meters. Mm -hmm. And so... And to speak to that, you know, on land mining, when they're preparing to mine on land, they only have to uh, categorize any species that's maybe like bigger than a foot or longer than a foot. But, you know, for the ocean, you have to categorize the ones that are less than a, a yeah. centimeter, is yeah, what yeah. I've heard. So. Well, that's mm -hmm. right. It's like vertebrates and above on land, whereas mm -hmm. on the ocean floor, you know, it, it, everything is ca categorized. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we're not comparing, unfortunately, apples with apples. We're, we're exactly a whole different set of criteria. And of course, mm -hmm. um, you know that's why you know we we do have an amazing array of ocean scientists who are working with us on this ocean program. But mm -hmm. I do find that we have to keep reminding our stakeholders that it's. We have to be taking everything, putting everything in context, right? Because sure. you know, every organism on the planet is important, but we have to realize that also everything we do has impacts. Every mm -hmm. single decision we make, every move we make has an impact. If it has no impact, generally it's not worth doing, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we have to do is provide the information to say, okay, if we continue on land, then these are the impacts. And largely they're known, right? They're known impacts because we've been able to see them over the last 10, 50, 100 years. Whereas in the ocean, there's also going to be the, some, the impacts. And our ocean research program is about identifying and assessing what they will be. And then it's like to say, okay, society, which one should we be doing? You know, mm -hmm. these are the known based impacts. And if we keep doing that, it's like climate change. If we keep heating up the planet, then we're mm -hmm. all going to be toast. Whereas we need to address that. We need to burn less fossil fuels. We need to stop emitting CO2 gases. And, of course, um, one of the major contributors to that is the mining industry. But it, it just hasn't had the same attention that the oil and gas industry has had. And, mm -hmm. um, so, but, but, you know, that's going to change. Yeah, definitely. So now that let's uh, say that you've extracted all these and you're starting to produce these batteries, uh, what's, what's the most exciting part of that? And uh, I've heard that you're going to have some recycling aspects to this. Um, sure. If you just want to speak to that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, as an organization, um, we are absolutely committed about turning these into atoms as a service, which means mm -hmm. that we are total fans of the circular economy. So it means that we need to stop extracting. You know, we need to, you know, I think consumers will favor brands that use more and more recycled materials. It's mm -hmm. inevitable. And one of the beauties of what we're doing is we will measure every single thing we do. We're going to measure, you know, through some sort of distributed ledger technology, blockchain or other, you know, we'll be able to tell you when we collected it where we processed it, who we sold it to, which car it ended up in. And so, so this DNA is going to travel with these metals, which means that when we go to recycle these materials, you know, we're not, our plan is not to sell the metals. It's, our plan is to rent them out and to make sure that we get them back because in, in 40 years' time, we do not want to be in the business of collecting these metals. We want to be in the recycling business because, mm -hmm. I, you know, I have great faith in humans that humans will have, with more and more knowledge will make better and better decisions and a better decision will be to use more and more recycled materials to stop these extractive industries and but at the moment it's not an option because there are not enough metals in the system to recycle because mm -hmm. and just think about that for a moment you know how many electric vehicles are out there? You know, let's say 5 million is a number, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a billion cars on the road, okay? There's, a, there's so many households that are using gas and coal-powered, uh, fired power. So there's a lot of, 
you know, there's heavy transportation, there's, there's devices everywhere. That, so we need lots and lots of batteries. But of course, you know, to, to, first of all, you need the injection of materials to build the batteries. And if, if we sell an electric car today, the metals that are used in the battery and most of the car are entirely recyclable, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we won't be able to recycle that car that we sell today for another 10 years because it's going to be on the roads driving around. Mm -hmm. And the sales of electric vehicles are and will continue to, to increase at an exponential rate. And so that means we need a massive injection of metals into the system before we can start recycling them. Because let's take nickel as an example. Most of the nickel in, on the planet today is in steel. And it's used in construction, in the infrastructure in the planet upon which we mm -hmm. live. So you can't recycle that. You can't recycle you know, something in a building, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so, but over time, I'm absolutely convinced that, you know, consumers, people like you and I, will favor brands who use more and more recycled material. And, and you know, we're going to be able to tell people what the impacts of using our metals are, how much CO2 was generated, how much water was used to generate the battery, how much child labor was used, how many trees mm -hmm. were cut down, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. And I think mm -hmm. that will build a, a, a massive following around ocean metals because our impacts are going to be at a fraction of the impact of land-based supply. So. People would definitely prefer, or I would definitely prefer to buy a Tesla <laughs> that was made with lower impact battery you know, uh, resources, for sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and of course, mm -hmm. in the past, people haven't had to think much about it, right? <laughs> or they haven't mm -hmm. thought much about it. But as we move <laughs> forward, they will think more about it, you know, more and more. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, well, they haven't. We, we just haven't really had options uh, no. lately. No, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's exciting, right? Because mm -hmm. if uh, and and the other exciting part is that. Uh, you know, we are sponsored by developing nations. We will pay a lot of royalty money every year that will go back to those developing countries. And mm -hmm. those royalties will be used to, you know, to build infrastructure for those developing countries, to, to try and bridge the massive inequality gaps between, you know, communities that are living in poverty that don't have access to the, the, the resources um, and so that's a nice feature as well. Like, like our license areas are sponsored by developing nations in the Pacific, Pacific Ocean. And those, those nations look forward to this as something that will provide some economic prosperity, some jobs, some hope for their future. And so, hopefully, mm -hmm. and so hopefully they can also skip like the, you know, oil phase yeah. of uh, development. That's right. It that's seems right. like the hope there as well. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Mm -hmm. Precisely. That's really awesome. Yeah, no, I think that's a nice feel-good factor about this resource mm -hmm. project. And, and this will be like the first time that a, an asset that is deemed the common heritage of mankind, which means we all own it, is mm -hmm. developed for the good of everyone, mm -hmm. with benefits largely flowing back to those developing nations. And, and I also uh, watched your COG X presentation uh, about the you're creating like uh cities on the sea can you speak yeah. to that <laughs> yeah i mean this is um this is one of the really cool things right because our production platforms ocean research platforms will will have hundreds of people working on them right mm -hmm. over time more and more will get automated but, but i could imagine us eventually having thousands of people out there either working on our production platforms or working on ocean research platforms. And mm -hmm. so it takes four and a half days from San Diego to reach our area and, and even further west, east, sorry. Um, and so typically what happens is, you know, people go out and they work for six weeks and then they come back. But that's kind mm -hmm. of disruptive and it's not necessarily good for people's mental health. And so I – you know, one of the challenges we have is that it's estimated 90% of coastal communities will be impacted by rising sea levels. And mm -hmm. two of our nations, one being Kiribati, our sponsoring countries, Kiribati and Tonga, will be 
the earliest nations impacted by rising sea levels. And so eventually we're going to have to solve this. And, and I think it's an exciting opportunity. And we're working with one of the best architectural minds on the planet, Bjarke Ingels, and hmm. to say, let's, let's build these floating communities that will allow people to go to work every day, but come home, come home to their factory, and they'll be truly closed loop little economies. You know, people will grow what they need on the islands. You know, they will recycle every single thing. And it means kids will be educated there. Hopefully there'll be some tourism there. There'll be ocean scientific research schools there. And, you know, this will be a pointer to how these communities that will be heavily impacted by rising sea levels, you know, will need to cope in the future. And, and um, you know, Kiribati. It, it, mm -hmm. It's really cool that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, 120,000 people in Kiribati, and, and you know, in time, they're going to need to be really relocated somewhere. And um, yeah, so the great lessons will be taken out of this. And 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 the thing about a floating island or a floating city is, it's easier when you have a use case. And we have a use case, right? We're going to have a production. Yeah, that's case. what I was going to say. Yeah. Is that you know everybody was kind of looking for a reason to start seasteading, but now there's you know, a profitable reason to be out there. So then it makes sense to start generating those communities instead of bootstrapping it with uh, no reason really to be out there. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, that's really awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I to see that in innovation everywhere, um, which is why we hired Biake, because, you know, if you go to Copenhagen now, you'll see uh, last year he launched this recycling uh, waste facility which was built, well, he designed He designed it, he designed it. Um, but it's basically a recycling plant in a pre-nized area. He's built a on top of So it's, it's a way of, you know, bringing great form to important function. And we mm -hmm. can see areas of improvement, you know, because we think of our collector machines as gentle giants. You know, we want them to be as as least impact on the ocean floor as possible. We want our production platforms to be the most efficient possible from a, from a power generation and storage and then transfer of the nodules onto our transportation fleet with our floating islands. And so, you know, there's massive room for improvement with all of that. And so it's exciting to, to think of, you know, someone like uh, Biarque's firm who are saying, you know, well, we build beautiful buildings and art galleries and museums or waste plants. And we also want to help you, you know, build beautiful industrial functioning ideas. And so, yeah. yeah, and that will excite people, I think. Definitely. Yeah. No, that's very exciting to me. And I'm sure, you know, the seasaying community might also be very excited about that. And yeah, <laughs> uh, just <laughs> any developing country for sure. Um, yeah. Cool. Do you think that there's any other questions that I should ask you or something that you'd like to speak about? Um, um, well, what else? I just broke my nodule jack. Wow. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. Which tells you, uh, luckily, I have a few more, but um, yeah. uh, which tells you just how uh, French, how easily they crush, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's, which is a really useful thing because we don't spend a lot of energy. Uh, crushing them. Uh, no, I think I'm pretty good. I mean, I'm excited when I talk about this project with people of your vintage because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes people, uh, the baby boomer sect, can be a little bit skeptical about life because they've been the ones who've impacted, you know, the planet the most. You know, it was take, take, take. Whereas, you know, I'm always excited when I speak to your generation about, you know, when you lay the facts out. The facts are, where would you, if we were starting again, where would you go to get these metals from? You know, would you go 4,000 meters below sea, sea water mm -hmm. you know, to collect them from the bottom of the yeah, ocean? you look for the lowest impact. That's right, exactly. And so, um, you know, and I, 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 it, of course, it, it, we have to be very patient about how we gather this information. But there's also a, a high um, and urgent demand right now because – you know, sometimes people will go, well, we need to be cautious. Maybe we should wait and just do it a little bit. But the thing is, 
you know, the, the global warming is not waiting. You know, we mm. are running out of our carbon budget. You know, we need to be moving faster. We need to be, you know, making this move towards ending extractive industries. We need to be making the transition to renewable energy. We need to be having much higher utilization of our transport fleet, less cars on the road. And the cars that are there, they need to be driven by by uh, electric vehicles, batteries, mm -hmm. and need to be charged with renewable energy. And when you start putting all of those impacts together, you can see how we're going to make a much better planet. But but the one thing we need to do is we need to be moving faster. And, and you know, I, I just ask people to to dig a bit deeper, you know, and you'll find enormous resources on our website at deep.green around what are the impacts that we know. You know, one of our commitments is to be very transparent, to travel in the open, but also let's have some proper grown-up conversations, you know. Mm -hmm. Let's have grown-up conversations about what we need to do and, um, you know, what's the right thing from a planetary perspective. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I definitely love the mission and I'm looking forward to see how it goes. And, uh, you know, I think that a lot of people seeing that it's lower impact will definitely support it, even though it's count it's slightly counterintuitive that it's uh, in the ocean, but it's, you know, undeniably lower impact. Yeah. So uh, exactly. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the time, uh, Jared, and I look forward to Thanks. seeing it, how everything goes yeah. with Deep Green. And hopefully, you know, I'll get to go out on one of the vessels at some point, uh, you know, once everything starts moving again. <laughs> That'd be really awesome. Yeah, we'll have you over to um, to Delft to, to look at our harvester when it's uh, yeah you know, over the launch as well. So you'll be very well. That'd welcome. be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be really awesome to see. Okay, cool. Thank you, Jared. I appreciate it. Uh, okay. Talk soon. <laughs> Yo, what's up guys? Thanks for watching. Let me know what you thought in the comments below and definitely be sure to like and subscribe for more. I really appreciate Jared for taking the time out of his day to interview with me. And then also I have more YouTube videos coming up that I'm working on uh, some essays about like future of specific topics. So I'm really excited to post those. So I'll see you guys soon.